encouragement from the word of God. Some of you know that I do not often engage with politics from the pulpit. Be assured, it is not because I'm afraid of what people might think about my political positions. That is not why I do not do that. In fact, just to prove it, this morning I'm going to get political. Are you ready for this? Here's a question for you to contemplate. Who is the most important political figure? If you were to answer that question for today, you might say President Biden, since he is, as the pundits like to say, the leader of the free world. Or some might still say, Trump is the most important in terms of his disruptive impact on politics today. If we were to broaden our gaze to the last 100 years, maybe someone would mention JFK, MLK, FDR, or some other acronym. People like leaders, not only with acronyms, but just those you can identify with one name, like Churchill, or Gorbachev, or Reagan. We could include some of the more infamous types like Hitler, Lenin, Stalin. Who is the most important political figure? We could broaden out even further to the last few hundred years and we think of individuals like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln. But as important as all of these figures may be on a political level, the individual we are going to talk about this morning, and I know you'll be unbelievably shocked to find that I'm going to argue that the most politically significant figure ever to live in this world is Jesus Messiah. Now, you might be thinking, Jesus political? Well, actually, yes, and I have biblical proof. Uh, maybe not in the way we think of political, but when I looked up political in my trusty Funk and Wagnall dictionary, it says under the very first definition, concerned in the administration of government. So here's my question for you. Is Jesus concerned in the administration of government? Didn't we hear a little bit from Isaiah 9 today? We talked about it last week. Isaiah 9 verse 6 says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of Yahweh Almighty will accomplish this. Is Jesus concerned with the administration of government? You bet he is. However, unlike human governments and leaders that come and go, the government of Christ is forever. Isn't that true? I mean, this is kind of the, one of the points that we've been studying throughout this journey that we've been on of late as we've been looking at the arrival of the prophesied Messiah. Over the last few weeks, we've seen Jesus' significance in the Hebrew Scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, the Tanakh. From Genesis on, we have found that the Hebrew Scriptures begin telling the story of Messiah long before his birth. It is this reality that Jesus points to after his resurrection in Luke 24, Verse 44, a verse we began pondering last week, we pick it up again. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Jesus points to the fact here that his story began long before his birth. If you really want to understand Christ's significance, read the 1,000 plus years of narrative written about him before he came to earth as a baby, as found in the Hebrew Scriptures. Remember, the Hebrew Scriptures are comprised of three sections, and here's the clearest example in the New Testament, 
of what Bible Jesus read. You want to know what Bible Jesus read? He read the Tanakh. How do I know that? Because the law is Torah. That's the T in Tanakh. The prophets is Nevi'im in Hebrew. That's the N in Tanakh. And the Psalms are not the writings, but they are the first book in the writings, the Kethubim, the K in Tanakh. And so here Jesus actually replaces the word writings with Psalms because it's the first book. It's the largest book in the writings. But this is the same Bible that Jesus read. He knew his Hebrew Bible. Of course, he didn't know it as the Old Testament, but he did teach us that there was a new covenant that was coming, and that's what he was ushering in, which is why we call it Old Testament, New Testament. So we're going to take a look once again, if we can, at our Old Testament history. Now, we've covered almost all of this already, but we'll begin with the box in the bottom left corner, your left, where we see the word the law or Torah. Two weeks ago, the first Sunday of Advent, we started our journey of unveiling the biblical Jesus in Genesis, the first book of the law of Moses. In Genesis 3, Messiah is mentioned the first time after Adam and Eve chose to sin against their creator. Now, he's not mentioned in name. He's referred to specifically as the seed of the woman who would crush the serpent's head. And so this is our preparation right there in the very same chapter where Adam and Eve said, we know better than you, God, and we're going to choose to eat from this tree because we don't think you have our best interest at heart. By the way, isn't that a lot of sin? Even you think of little kids. Mom, you're, you're only saying no because you don't love me. You're keeping this wonderful blessing from me. Honestly, a lot of times we're just like little kids. God, I know better than you. I know what's best for me. And so Adam and Eve, of course, cho chose what they thought was best in disobedience to their creator. But there was a promise just after they made this decision that the seed of the woman would crush the serpent. After the stories in Genesis of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Genesis concludes with a blessing on the 12 tribes of Israel. But especially at the end, Genesis 49.10, we see this blessing on Judah of the 12 tribes and the indication that from Judah would come a ruler, that he would have the scepter. We'll talk about that more a little bit later. We also saw the Messiah pictured in Moses, who led the exodus of God's people from slavery in Egypt, and in Deuteronomy's conclusion of the Torah. So that's the first five books. The law is the first five books. We call it the Pentateuch, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and concludes with Deuteronomy. And so at the conclusion of the Torah, those first five books, we see this foreshadowing of a prophet like Moses. And so begins our longing for another prophet who would come along and teach us about God. In our second sermon, that was last Sunday, we moved into the second portion of the Hebrew Bible. That's the prophets or the Nevi'im, and that's there in the bottom box on the right. In the book of the prophet Zechariah, our understanding of the Messiah was greatly expanded as we saw that he would not only be king of all, but he would be a priest and mediator between God and man. However, today... We arrive at the third section of the Tanakh, the writings, the Hebrew script, the, uh, the writings, the, the Tanakh is there at the bottom uh, right corner, you see the Kethubim. And by the way, Kethubim is just the Hebrew word from the Hebrew word katav, which means to write. So here are the writings about the Messiah. And what we see is that in the writings, God unfolds to the fullest extent in the Hebrew scriptures of who Jesus Messiah would be. But there's a specific focus in the writings on the kings of Israel, what they're doing, uh, and the spe specifically the fact that they're in exile, but God's going to lead them out of exile, and God is going to enable them to return to the land. So Jesus refers to the writings in Luke 24, as I mentioned, as the Psalms, um, but he's talking about the same group of scriptures that we're looking at today. By the way, there are some prophets that are included in the, in the writings. Do you see that there? So don't think that because there's a section that's called the prophets that only prophets are in this section. They're also found in the writings. Um, but it's more about the progress of the revelation and the unveiling of who Messiah is. Uh, Daniel, by the way, it's a pretty important prophet. You see him there. But it's in Ezra Nehemiah that we see the return of Israel, 
and it is Chronicles that concludes the Hebrew Bible. And again, and if you want more detail on all this, you can watch the Story of God 90-minute seminar online, or you can watch the almost two-year uh, sermon series that we went through. But to me, this is one of the most convincing arguments of understanding what Bible Jesus read, because in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew text, the Bible ends with Chronicles. Um, and I always, as a kid, and I know I've told some of you, just plug your ears, because you heard me say this many times, but I remember as a kid, this was one of the things. I was reading through the Bible, like in high school or something, and I read First and Second Kings, and I got to First and Second Chronicles, and I'm like, wait a second, I just read this. Why am I reading all these same stories again? But you see, in the Hebrew Bible, First and Second Kings is way back here. Chronicles comes at the very end. And you know what Chronicles does that's different than First and Second Kings? Chronicles starts with Adam. So what Chronicles does is it says, okay, you've read this whole story. Now let me give you a recap. Starting with Adam, going through all these kings, and then Chronicles ends how? Someone tell me. How does Chronicles end? mid sentence. It doesn't complete a sentence. We know this because it's a quote from an edict that we find elsewhere. And we know that the whole edict is found in, I believe, the book of Ezra, but only half of the edict is found at the end of Chronicles. And so we are left off mid-sentence with the sense of longing at the end of the Tanakh, with this sense that the story has not been completed. There's more to the story. Of course, it's more than just the fact that it ends mid-sentence. It's all these prophecies about this Messiah who would come and save God's people. And God's people know it hasn't happened yet. Even returning to the land, which we talked about a few years back in our Ezra Nehemiah sermon series, at the end of Ezra and Nehemiah, they're back in the land. They've rebuilt the temple, the, the walls of Jerusalem. But still, things are not right. There is this disconnect between the people of God and their God. And so we, we leave off with this sense of longing, but we're going to back up here to the first book of the writings, which is the book of the Psalms. And so as we, as we move to this book, I love, uh, let me see here, let me get, if you hadn't noticed, I'm a, I'm a long way from my sermon notes, so let's see if I can get back to where, wherever I was supposed to be here. Um, the first book of the writings, the Psalms, is where we're going to turn our focus. Please turn your Bibles, if you haven't already done so, to Psalm 2. You can also grab your sermon outlines, although there isn't much of an outline. And I promise you, it's not just because I'm lazy, but uh, I don't have a specific outline to what we're doing today. So please feel free to um, draw. If you like to draw, you can draw. Or you can take any notes that seem especially significant to you. But we're going to look at Psalm 2. Uh, which, by the way, is one of the most political uh, psalms or texts in the entire Bible. But in Psalm 2, uh, we see the greatest unveiling of Messiah to date. Specifically, we are going to unveil a side of Jesus that we seldom think about, but as we will find in our continued journey through the Old Testament this morning, Jesus Messiah is far and away the most significant of political figures. Follow along as I begin reading Psalm 2, verses 1 through 3. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against Yahweh and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. We'll pause there. Right off the bat, we get a sense of the political nature of this psalm. From the start of Psalm 2, we are thrust into the middle of this worldwide political conflict between the kings of the earth on one side and Yahweh and his anointed one on the other. More on that in just a moment. However, I love what Hebrew professor Ron Allen says Regarding the psalm, he says, if in the past you have thought of the psalms as sweet poems, which say nice things about God, Psalm 2 will present a difficulty. Talk about an understatement. Psalm 2 is not a sweet poem. It is powerful prophecy with massive political implications. Psalm 2 is quoted at least three times in the book of Revelation. 
the great book of prophecy in our Bibles. This psalm is also quoted in the prayer of Acts 4 after Peter and John were interrogated by the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council. And this psalm is quoted by Paul with regards to Christ's resurrection. Not only this, but Psalm 2 itself includes a quote from one of the most significant passages in Scripture, 2 Samuel 7. It's one we've already looked at where we find the Davidic covenant which we considered briefly last Sunday, where God says, I'm going to build you a house, David, and your line, your kingly line, will never cease. So we've established that Psalm 2 is a very important prophetic psalm. However, at the heart of its significance is its focus on one of the most significant characters in all of God's word, and that is Messiah, the Messiah, the Christ. Translated in English in your Bible as anointed one, you hopefully, in your Bible, have a little note that says, see below, and you find out below that this is the word for Messiah. Same thing we translate into English as the Christ. Of him, the psalmist writes these words, asks these questions. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against Yahweh and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. So the title anointed one makes reference here to a ceremony by which a prophet of God would anoint with oil the person who was to become king. And so when we say that Jesus is the anointed one, we are saying that Yahweh has anointed him to be his spokesperson, to be his ruler. Now, as I mentioned, the word anointed one is actually Messiah or Christ. The irony of this passage is that even though Yahweh God has chosen his anointed one, his king, the kings of the earth take their stand against him. Now, just ponder that for a second. That the God of all creation says, here is my anointed who will bring salvation to the world. But the kings of the earth reject him, stand opposed to God's anointed one. Look at how this section ends in verse 3. It says, let us break their chains and throw off their fetters. Every time I read those verses, I think, isn't that our world? I mean, isn't that how our world responds to God's moral law? For sure. Let us break their chains. Don't bind me. Don't tell me what to do. I'll live life the way I choose to live life. Throw off their fetters. You're, you're, you're bringing me down. This is our world's response to the truth of God's word. The truth is, however, I think we as followers of Christ are more tempted to this than we would like to think. Because I think, too, sometimes we want to say, God, don't limit me in what I can do. <laughs> my, my daughter... Would, uh, would often say as a joke, I think it was a joke. I'm not, I'm not sure, I think it was a joke. But when she was an older teen, she would say, you're not the boss of me. <laughs> Joking, Lee. <laughs> of course, in our world today, it, it's a crazy world. Um, it's almost as if we've said that kids don't need anyone to be in charge, uh, to be a parent, to tell them what is right and wrong. It's a crazy world we live in. Uh, By the way, along those lines, uh, in the new year, we're going to be doing a class, just a a seminar class, some encouragement for for parents of kids, because it's tough today in the world in which we live in. Again, I'm going to get back to my sermon here. Uh, But that that is the attitude that we see in our world, this desire to live by our own rule, to live life our own way. Does that sound like anyone you know? I'm thinking about thousands of years ago. I mean, Adam and Eve, wasn't that exactly what the sin came from? It was a decision, God, we'll live life our way. Thanks, God, for the recommendations. But we've got it covered from here. 
I really appreciate the commentary that I read this week about how these verses highlight, and this is what the author says, the quiet sovereignty of God and the obtuseness of man. (laughs) Isn't that us? And isn't that our God? You know, God doesn't come knocking us over the head and saying, come on, you know? Yikes. Quiet sovereignty. Many people don't recognize But we, of all people, should, that God is in control, that this is our Father's world, and that he continues to accomplish his purposes. But sometimes we are so obtuse, we are so unable to see who we are, who he is, and who we are to be in response to the fact that he is God, and we are not. In the next section, we see God's response to man's obtuseness, In this response, the one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I I was thinking of the word hubris, which is a Greek word that simply means excessive pride. And I think it's the only appropriate word to describe what, what God is responding to here in Psalm 2. What? What hubris it is for us to say, God, you don't know what you're doing. We'll take over. God calls them on it. It makes me think of certain religious figures today who say that it doesn't matter what we believe about Jesus as long as we try to be good people. Doesn't matter what we do with God's Messiah. Have you read Psalm 2? It does matter. God does care about how you respond to Jesus. And how does God respond? He laughs. And I can just hear this laugh. It's an incredulous laugh. It's like, oh, oh, really? I mean, I just, I kind of feel like that's how God laughs when he sees us human beings shaking our puny fists at heaven and saying, no, this is what's right. God is God and I am not. I've installed my king on my holy hill. And one day every knee is going to bow to him as king. Now up to this point, it is possible to see this king as David. You think, okay, well David's just talking about himself, however. The fact that this king is someone even greater than David is made clear when you begin in verse 7. It says, I will proclaim the decree of Yahweh. He said to me, you are my son, today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. In verse 7, do you recognize a quote from another very significant scripture related to my Messiah? You are my son, today I have become your father. Where is that from? This is a quote from God's promise to David in 2 Samuel 7, that God would give him an everlasting kingdom. Don't think it's an accident that right here at the beginning of the first book of the writings, that the author is making a connection for us to one of the most significant passages in the prophets. It's not just interesting, it's on purpose. It's so that you'll catch a clue as you're reading, wait, this is... This is one big story. It's all connected. This is that same one that's referenced in 2 Samuel 7.14. We see referenced here again in Psalm 2. We see that the Bible is not intended to be read as a bunch of different stories, but as one epic story, the story of God. In fact, Hebrews 1 does an excellent job of helping us to see that it is all part of one big story. Hebrews chapter 1, specifically verses, if I can get there, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, there it is, says, in the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, 
He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, so he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have become your father, or again, I will be his father, and he will be my son. There are two quotes in Hebrews, one from Psalm 2-7, the other from 2 Samuel 7. It is in this passage in 2 Samuel 7 that God makes this promise to David, when your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you who will come from your own body and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. Do you see how these passages about the Messiah tie together? Psalm 2 purposely quotes from 2 Samuel 7 to indicate that it's not just talking about any king, it's talking about the king of whom it could be said he is the son of God. So we return back to Psalm 2-7 again. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, the covenant God made with David. So we talk about all the covenants. We talk about the Abrahamic covenant the Mosaic Covenant, where we have the Ten Commandments, and God leading people through Moses out of slavery in Egypt. But then, in the Promised Land, God raises up this king after his own heart, David. And so we see this Davidic Covenant, because David said, I want to build you a temple, God. I want to build you a house. And God says, no, I'm going to build you a house. And he goes on to say that I'm going to give you a royal line that will never end. By the way, David is a son of Judah, a, uh, a descendant, I should say, of Judah. So it's fulfilling that prophecy. But there's this promise. And again, we talked about this last week. After David, Solomon, after Solomon, his son, and the kingdom was divided and everything went haywire because we did what we like to do as human beings. We turned away from God in his ways. And then everything goes belly up. And so this is the state of affairs. But God says, I'm still not finished. In Psalm 2, even though you turned away from me, I still am going to fulfill this promise that I've made. In fact, we see this not only in the father-son imagery, but also in the imagery of the scepter and the obedience of the nations in verses 8 and 9. Ask of me and I'll make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash into pieces like pottery. Jesus is the fulfillment of Genesis 49, verse 10. So again, now we're going all the way back to the final, excuse me, the first book in Torah, Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, where we see these prophecies. Each of the members of the 12 tribes, there's a prophecy given for them, specifically for Judah. We read, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he comes to whom it belongs and the obedience of the nations is his. Do you see this connection in Psalm 2? The nations conspire and rage against Yahweh and against his anointed one. But what does Yahweh say about his son? It says, when it's finished, you will find that he is the ruler. And here's the thing. Jesus is king whether you confess it or not. Whether this world confesses it or not, Jesus is king. Jesus is the one who will return again. And that's why we celebrate Christmas, not just because he came as a baby, but because he's coming back to once and for all make all things good. He's the king doesn't matter what I believe. This is God's story. And again, it's all one story. It's all connected. The picture here in Psalm 2.9 is that one day all nations will be in submission to Yahweh's messianic king. That's the picture. You will rule them with an iron scepter. And so how should mankind respond to this knowledge? Verses 10 to 12. Therefore, you kings, be wise. 
Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you be destroyed in your way, for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. The end of the psalm takes us back to the beginning of the psalm. And it's this warning for the nations and those kings who conspire against Yahweh and his Messiah. After revealing the end of those who refuse to submit to Christ, the psalmist encourages them to serve Yahweh with fear and rejoice with trembling. In other words, recognize that God is God, submit yourself to his authority, and serve him only. I love what one commentator says about the sun's wrath flaring up. He says, the quick anger may sound like the touchiness of the despot, but the true comparison is with Christ, whose wrath, like his compassion, blazed up at wrongs. When his moment comes for judgment, in any case, it will be, by definition, beyond appeasing or postponing. Do you know that? I mean, I love the nativity as much as the next guy. I love little baby Jesus in the manger. As long as we remember that this baby in a manger grew up and that he taught us and showed us who God is. And that he died on the cross to destroy the power of sin and death. And that he reigns even at this moment at the right hand of God the Father. And that this same Jesus is coming back again to rescue those who call on his name. And to destroy every remnant of sin and death in this world. Won't that be glory? This is the promise that we have right here in Psalm 2, pointing us to Jesus. I think, again, people love that picture of baby Jesus, meek and mild. And yes, there's a meekness to him. But you got to remember, if you know your Gospels, that Jesus got pretty passionate about some things, didn't he? Do you remember the things he got passionate about? Well, he certainly got passionate in the temple when they were turning God's house into a den of robbers, when they were using the temple to steal from God's people. That was something that made him angry. We also think about his response to those who are ready to stone the woman who was caught in adultery. And I think, maybe you think it's not passion, but I think there was passion, bridal passion, when he got down on the ground And he was carving those words into the dirt. And he said, you who have no sin, you go ahead and throw that first stone. And what they do? They they drop their stones. And I believe Jesus got passionate when the disciples said, no, no, kids, stay away from the master. He hasn't got time for you. I mean, he's important. And Jesus said, don't forbid the kids from coming to me for as such as these belongs the kingdom of heaven. Jesus got passionate. He got passionate when his disciples didn't trust him. Do you know that's one of the things he got most passionate? He says, oh, you of little faith. And here's the great thing. In the midst of these stories, you see the Syrophoenician woman. You see other who are non-Jews. They're not part of the chosen people, and yet they're showing great faith. And Jesus turns to his disciples. By the way, this is what amazes Jesus. I can't remember if I shared this. You want to know what amazes Jesus? Two things amaze Jesus. Genuine faith and a lack of faith. We read in, in Mark that he was amazed, I believe it was in Mark, at the disciples' lack of faith. He was, it was amazing to him. Why don't, why don't you trust? Haven't, you've been with me, right? You've been walking with me. But believers, don't we do the same thing? How many of us have been walking with Jesus for two decades or more? Uh, Do you who've been walking with Jesus, who've seen him work in your life, do you ever struggle to trust him? 
even sometimes just in the small things. When we allow things to overwhelm us and, and take away or rob us of joy and peace because we don't trust that he's in control. When we, when we demand that we get our revenge, we were talking about that in our final peacemaking Sunday school class this morning. When we, I have the right, I'm going to get my rights. I'm going to put you in your place because you offended me. When we say instead, it's God's to avenge, he will repay. I'll trust him. I'll leave it to him. This is what amazes Jesus, is those who trust. And it also amazes him, those who refuse to trust. See, the, the world loves to portray God the Father as some senile old man. You ever seen this picture of God? He, he kind of reminds me of the old king in Princess Bride. Do you know who I'm talking about? He's talking to uh, Princess Buttercup, and she's describing how she's going to face this horrible death and horrible things are happening. And what does he say? That's nice, dearie. I don't know, something like that. But that's how we kind of see God. He's a little senile, doesn't really know all that's going on, and he's just there to say, that's nice. It's going to be okay. Is that your picture of God? And our world loves to see the sun as a perpetual babe in the manger. But don't imagine for a minute that Jesus is still in that manger. Jesus was a baby, but he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he shall reign forever and ever. I can't help it. I always have to go back to the Messiah at Christmas time. He shall reign forever and ever. And the government will be upon his shoulders. He is the king of kings. The Lord of lords. Have you bowed the knee to your God? I know we don't like to do that to anyone in our culture. We bow the knee to no one. Right? Because we're human beings. And I, again, I, I need to get some new material here. But I always think of Salieri in Mozart. Don't watch that movie. It's, you know, it's an old movie. But anyway, how he says, uh, uh, he has this scene where he's crying out against God. God, why don't I have Mozart's gifts? And he cries out and he says, I tell you, man is not mocked. And it, excuse me. Oh, man, I messed that up. He says, they say, God is not mocked. I tell you, man is not mocked. This is Salieri's pride, his hubris speaking Believers, God is not mocked. He is still God. No matter what laws we make in this land, no matter what our leaders say, no matter what politician comes up with some new brilliant way to say that man is the end-all be-all, God is still God. Have you bowed the knee to this God? And I'm not talking about bowing the knee to a religion either. I'm not. I'm talking about bowing the knee in the context of a relationship with the one who made you. He is the one who is faithful. You need to know, I love my wife. I'm grateful for a wife who loves the Lord. I'm grateful for nearly 30 years of marriage. But do you know what? She has failed me. And do you know what? I have failed her. We can't be to each other what God is to us because God is the one who does not fail you. So our, our world says, if you find romance, then you'll have everything. Really? Have you seen the divorce rate? <laughs> if you look to your mate to be your end-all be-all, you will be disappointed. But if you look to Jesus, he will never disappoint you because he will never leave you nor forsake you. That is his promise. You see, he is king of kings and he rules with an iron scepter. But elsewhere we read that he shall lead his flock like a shepherd. Again, Messiah, I can't help it. But this is our Jesus. Do you know this Jesus? 
I mean, you wonder why, why is he going off on all this stuff this last Sunday before Christmas? It's because, honestly, I don't care what you get for Christmas. If you don't have Jesus, then you're missing out. You're missing out. Will you embrace him? Will you put your faith in him? Will you look to him for the love that we look for all, in all looking for love in all the wrong places, right? That's us. Jesus is the source of true love, of agape. That was, that was awesome. That was a word on Jeopardy. This, if, all the, if all the questions were like that on Jeopardy, I'd win Jeopardy. <laughs> Five-letter word that Christians use to describe love starts with an A. Uh, do you know that love? Do you know that peace that passes understanding? Let Christ be the king of your life. For as this passage concludes, blessed are all who take refuge in him. Listen, this challenge to rulers of the earth thousands of years ago is no less relevant for you and me today. If we would know divine blessings, we must repent of our sinful refusal to submit to God and take refuge in him. Almost 200 years ago, after his visit to America, the famed French historian Alexis de Tocqueville, I hope I pronounced that right, wrote this perceptive observation. So I love this. Here's this Frenchman, 200 years ago. He comes to America. He checks out what the people in America are like. And this is what he concludes. Each citizen is habitually engaged in the contemplation of a very puny object, namely himself. <laughs> and guess what? There was no TikTok or Instagram at that time. Can you believe it? What would he say now? This is our culture. Psalm 2 says, it's not about you. It's about the Son of God. Have you submitted your life to Christ's rule? It starts by repenting of our infatuation with the self, our pursuit of self-justification, our desire to define righteousness by our standards, and turning to Christ in faith for his forgiveness, his justification, his righteousness. It is his favor that matters. Do you see how you get to experience favor, the favor of the Son in Psalm 2? Do you see that? It's not by heroic deeds. It's simply by paying homage to the Son as Lord. Do you see that in Psalm 2? It's not, I got to be good enough to please God. I got to do all the right things, say the right words. It's, do you pay homage to the Son? Do you bow the knee to Him? Do you recognize him as Lord? The same is true in the New Testament. Salvation is by grace. It's unmerited favor. Jesus bestows his favor on us. Forgiveness of sin and reconciliation with God. Not because we merit it, but because as Psalm 2 concludes, we take refuge in him. Because we acknowledge we can't do it on our own. We need you, God. Are you tired of trying to prove yourself to others? To yourself? To God? The New Testament makes clear there is no justifying ourselves. We are all guilty of unjust actions, all of us. The Bible calls it sin. But Jesus justifies. He renders us righteous if we trust in him. Kiss the son. Take refuge in him. Have you done that? Will you do it today? Of course, trusting in Christ for salvation is only the beginning. It continues as we learn to live daily for Christ. How do we do that? Well, in part... It is coming to see that life is more than just my puny wants. It is seeing yourself as part of a greater story that will end in the worldwide reign of Jesus Messiah. The third and final section of the Tanakh begins with this powerful political statement about the coming Messiah. However, we must remember that by the end of the Hebrew Scriptures, Messiah's birth has not yet taken place. God's people are still waiting. As we, as we prayed this morning in the music, we sang, Come, thou long-expected Jesus. As I was singing those words, my thoughts were on his second coming. Come, Jesus. Come quickly, Lord. We need you. But here's the prayer of God's people at the end of the Tanakh, this longing for God's Messiah to come. And I mentioned it, Bible ends mid-sentence, as if to say the story isn't over. It concludes with these words. At the end of the Hebrew Bible, the end of Chronicles, says, let him go up. 
let him go up. Go up where? How does the story of the coming Messiah end? Well, we're going to find that out next week as we conclude today with that to be continued. I shouldn't say next week. I should say on Friday night. This will be our conclusion of this journey that we've gone on during the Advent season. This Friday on Christmas Eve, we'll finish this sentence as we turn to the birth story of Messiah, to the answer to the longing that we find in the Hebrew Bible. But for today, the beginning of Christmas week, we see Jesus, once a babe, forever, our King of kings and Lord of lords. Oh, come, let us adore him. Let's pray. And Lord, we thank you for the richness of your word and for the richness of the story that you have given to us, the story that reveals to us who you are, reveals to us who we are, reveals what you have done for us. God, thank you for your word. More and more, God, help us to see ourselves, not from a self-centered perspective, but from a God-centered perspective, from the perspective of your eternal word and your story that you're telling. God, we want to be part of your story and what you're doing in this world. Thank you that we get to be a part of that. God, continue to expand your kingdom through this church and specifically in our lives individually. We want to see your kingdom expressed in the way that we live every day. God, lead us now as we go into this Christmas week. Be glorified in how we love others and how we love you. We pray in Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. I want to mention to you before you depart, any of you who are in tonight's Christmas program who are singing, there's going to be a very brief rehearsal of a few songs, so I invite you to come right to the platform as we dismiss. And that's going to be a, a short time, but a needful time. And then come tonight, if you're not seeing, come tonight, 6 p.m., we'll gather together for our, a wonderful celebration. But I invite you to stand as we conclude for our benediction. And it's the words we find at the end of Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. It says, to our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen.